yeah. So today is class number six, possibly, or discussion number six, not quite sure. Is that right? Or number seven, even number seven. Time goes really quickly. And last week we were fortunate enough to have another bikini with us. Someone asked if she's here again today which is promising because it shows that you enjoy that kind of interaction. But it is uh, quite a rare privilege to have two bikinis in one space because there's so few of us to, you know, to support our communities. So um, having said that, I'm hoping to bring in another bikini for a Q&A session at the end of May. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Secret as to who it is. I don't think you've met her yet, unless you have in person, but not through Anna Camper. <laughs> So, as usual, I usually go through um, a little very brief summary of what we did the previous week, and I won't go through the whole thing. But I did feel like summarising the section on um, moral introspection, the section from the Rahula Sutta, and I'm actually not sure of the name of it from the Majjhima Nikaya number 61. Um, for the sake of those who have joined for the first time, we're going through this book and you don't have to have it at hand because I will read it out anyway. And uh, we'll go through probably not that much, maybe a couple of the passages that are taken out from the, uh, from the suttas. And this is the chapter on personal training. And so far we've looked mostly at generosity and now we're just getting into virtue. So from generosity as a foundation and a great attitude um, a sort of movement toward giving, towards generosity that underpins virtuous behaviour. We now get into more detail as to what that virtuous behaviour entails. And uh, we started last week, or one of the suttas we spoke about last week was um, the Buddha's discussion with his son, Rahula. And the Buddha asked him what the purpose is of a mirror. And of course, very wisely, his son said, for the purpose of reflection. So I was thinking about that today and thinking that um, mirrors don't judge us, you know. It's our human mind that judges us, but the mirror actually only reflects our face or our hand or whatever other part of the body we put in front of it, right? It, uh, it just shows us the truth as it is without covering anything up so that we can have an objective, realistic look at what's there, a look at what's inside in this particular context. And today, as I said, I was on a walk with a friend from Oxford and uh, it was the first time she'd met me. So uh, she'd known me, I think, probably from social media. And when she saw me, she said, oh, you do look like your photograph. I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, nuns kind of, we don't really hide very much. We don't have makeup, you know, we have little hair or we wear our beanie so there's not a lot you can hide and she said it's quite different from some of the people she knows who come to like big conferences because she organizes conferences for professionals and she said some of them put these pictures of them all muscular and bronzed you know in their youth and then they turn up to the conferences kind of you know quite out of shape middle-aged <laughs> quite different from their photo at the conference and I thought that was interesting because I think part of this path is to start being much more real and closer to the reality closer to the truth without trying to cover it up you know and that in a sense is the purpose of that mirror we use a mirror on our own mind and also on our actions and where those actions are coming from so the basic gist of that sutta was to reflect before we do any action of body speech or mind whether this is for our own, others, or both parties benefit. And ideally there, it should be for all three, yeah? So we reflect, is this action, would this action of body lead to my own and others and to both benefit um, and have pleasant consequences and results? Or would it lead to the affliction of ourselves, others, and both? and have unwholesome results with painful consequences. And then we do the same thing during the action. So we reflect in a similar way, would this action of body, speech or mind uh, lead to our affliction? Would it be unwholesome and have painful consequences and results? 
or would it not lead to our affliction or others affliction or the affliction of both and have whole be wholesome and have pleasant consequences and, and results and then afterwards we ask did it lead to affliction painful consequences and results or did it lead to a non-affliction was it wholesome did it have pleasant consequences and results so we can do this at every stage if we're really really aware um, and we can also do it at any stage so if we forget to do it initially we can still do it during the action or we can still do it in retrospect yeah and then the buddha in his great compassion gives us a solution just in case we have failed to do that and we have um you know, harmed another person or harmed ourselves, which is an inevitable part of being a human being. And it doesn't necessarily have to come from, you know, negativity or defilement. Even sometimes people who are very pure hearted and full of compassion and metta, they still may do actions of body or speech that inadvertently harm others. Yeah, maybe not reaching the sealer, but sometimes they can even breach their virtue. Even stream entrance can, not in major ways, but in small ways. Um, and so we have this lovely system of uh, confession in the Buddhist monastic uh, community and, and according to our training uh, in the Vinaya. And confession is a very Christian word in a sense. So I, I tend to kind of veer away from it a little bit. But in this sutta, it's lovely because it says that we um, reveal and confess, lay it open to a teacher or to a wise companion. So we basically disclose what's happened, we reveal it. And here it's saying to a teacher or a wise companion. So I was thinking about everybody here being lay and thinking that even if you don't have your spiritual teacher, you know, you might have friends in your community, you might have Dhamma sisters or brothers or maybe just somebody you trust and you can always tell them you know, oh, I did this thing today, I'm not sure I should have, it actually, I'm, I'm maybe not even sure if it's had wholesome or unwholesome consequences just yet, you know, and perhaps I had mixed motives, and if it's a good friend, they can reflect back to you, again, they can become a mirror for your own uh, understanding, for your deeper understanding of yourself, and it can be so beautiful, I often do that with my best friend, just to kind of check, you know, whether perhaps I could have been a bit more skillful and she knows me so well she'll sometimes say no you know you meant it this way and I'm like oh you're right of course and she'll really give me kind of the uh, I don't know if to use the word benefit of the doubt but she'll see my motivations in the best possible light but at other times you know I can invite that feedback or criticism also that's also another way of um, of learning more about ourselves so if we did do something that we later regret or realize was not very wholesome, we can reveal it, as I say, and the, the language is very lovely. Having confessed, revealed and laid it open to our teacher or that wise companion, we should undertake restraint for the future. So again, there's no punishment. It's not like you go to the Patimoka and you say all the things that you've maybe done, like maybe you had a nibble of some food after the designated time was up and they say, oh, that's terrible. That makes you a really bad monastic. No, it's not like that. Basically, they ask you, will you restrain yourself in the future? And then you say, yes, I will restrain in the future. And that's the end of it. But if you have done something beautiful, a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences and results, the Buddha gives advice for you too. So you don't just say, okay, fine, carry on. He actually says we can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. So tapping into that happiness and gladness, yeah, and noticing those consequences, because this is training the mind, teaching the mind, that actually pure-hearted actions do result in a kind of subtle, happiness but a happiness that becomes more and more evident to you the more you tune up to it and we should be happy and glad and give ourselves some credit it really goes against the grain of always finding fault with ourselves you know looking at what we did wrong because throughout the day you may have done a couple of things that you felt were you know not as skillful as they may have been perhaps you were tired perhaps you just didn't take enough time to you know write an email or phrase something in the proper way 
but what about all the beautiful wholesome things that you did or all the unwholesome things that you refrain from can you be happy and glad for that can you actually rouse that happiness in your mind and training day and night in wholesome states so that happiness and gladness encourages you to continue along that track yeah so that's just a little summary and yeah gunter's put in there that that was from the majima nikaya number 61 and uh i would like to get on with our first sutta of the day but i'll just quickly ask if there are any clarifications or comments around that so um not to get into a deep discussion right now but just to make sure things are clear that makes sense and we can have a bit more discussion later drawing on any of this okay great so the next sutta here on page 35 is from the Anguttara Nikaya number eight and this is just an excerpt from there so this starts I think on number five of the list or number four of the list so when it's Anguttara eight it means there are eight uh, particular things that the Buddha is looking at and going through and in this case it's called the eight streams of merit or the eight uh, streams of the wholesome nutriments of happiness which are heavenly ripening in happiness and conducive to heaven so this part is missed from the excerpt here but this is a bit of the background to the sutta and the buddha says that and these um eight streams of the wholesome nutriments of happiness that are heavenly ripening in happiness and conducive to heaven lead to what is wished for, desired and agreeable to one's welfare and happiness. And then the first three, which are not included here, go like this. So I'll read out from Sutta Central here. So it says here, a noble disciple has gone for refuge to the Buddha. This is the first stream of merit, stream of the wholesome nutriment of happiness, heavenly, ripening in happiness and conducive to heaven, that leads to what is wished for, desired and agreeable, to one's welfare and happiness. And the second one, again, a noble disciple has gone to refuge, or gone for refuge, to the Dhamma. And then the same consequences apply there. And then the third one, you can guess, <laughs> a noble disciple or anyone in training also anyone who's not a noble disciple has gone for refuge to the sangha and this is the first stream of merit etc that leads to one's welfare and happiness so taking refuge in the buddha dhamma sangha first of all are really really wholesome things to do and you will get the opportunity actually to do that with us as well in may on the 27th we have a vesak celebration and Ajahn Brahm will be giving those refuges and precepts as well for anyone who wishes and we can do this with our heart you know we don't have to do this through words we can go to refuge simply by understanding what those three um, aspects of the triple gem really mean so it's not a person it's not a religion it's not even a community of monastics that you're going to but it's what those things represent it's the quality of awakening in a Buddha it's the Dhamma you know, the law of cause and effect, the one Dhamma, the Dhamma of liberation, enlightenment itself. And then the Sangha, the noble disciples, not any particular disciple, but the fact that beings can be liberated, they can walk the same path that the Buddha walked and they too can experience those results. That there are such beings in the world, you know, who have purified their mind, who have entered the path and who are on the way to full liberation. So this is also very wonderful. And by taking refuge in these things, we're reminding our mind that there's something to aspire to. There's something we've yet to realize. You know, there's a happiness that we don't yet, um, that we haven't fully yet uh, touched deeply within ourselves. So that gives us as well, of course, a lot of encouragement. And then the next little paragraph, just before we start from Bhikkhu Bodhi's excerpt, is that there are, community these five gifts great gifts primal of long-standing traditional ancient unadulterated 
and never before adulterated, which are not being adulterated and will not be adulterated, not repudiated by wise aesthetics and Brahmins. What five? So now you can go to your book. <laughs> So, here a noble disciple, having abandoned the destruction of life, abstains from the destruction of life. By abstaining from the destruction of life, the noble disciple gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. They themselves, in turn, enjoy immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. This is the first gift, a great gift, primal of long standing, traditional, ancient, unadulterated, and never before adulterated, which is not being adulterated and will not be adulterated, not repudiated by wise ascetics and Brahmins. So in other words, there's this sort of inevitability about it that by abstaining from the destruction of life, we're giving an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. And it's just a natural law that we'll enjoy the same gifts ourselves. You know, if we are a nonviolent person, if we give others no reason to fear us, then it's very likely that we're going to enjoy safety ourselves. Of course, this is not always the case. There can be things that are unaccounted for. You know, we should never turn this the opposite way and say, oh, something bad happened to me. I must have done something terrible in the past. That's actually looking at karma the wrong way around. We're trying to look at the results of our actions and not make judgments or inferences about other people or even of ourselves that might be discouraging or that we just can't know about. But um, I think this is so beautiful because it's saying that it's timeless as well, right? It's traditional, ancient, unadulterated, never before adulterated and will not be adulterated. So it can't actually be changed. No one can change these natural laws. And they are timeless. They go beyond kind of time and place and culture and you know, era. And uh, in that sense, they're very long standing. It reminds me of another verse, it's in the Dhammapada. Um, I don't think it's the same Pali, I'm not quite sure, but there's a very beautiful verse that's quite famous and that's uh, that hatred never ceases through hatred, but through love alone it is appeased. And then the Buddha says, this is the eternal law, sanamtana. this is the eternal law. So there's no getting around that, you know, you're never going to bring about peace and love and harmony in the world by violence, even if you feel you're on the right side. You're on the side of the good, because as soon as you participate in violence, you're adding violence to the world and you're giving others a reason to retaliate, you know, and to fear you and to feel that you've to feel very misunderstood. So that's a very beautiful verse. I think that's number five in the Dhammapada. If you want to look it up. And it's, you know, these simple teachings sound so obvious in a way, and yet we can so easily forget them and start to justify all kinds of, you know, terrible um, acts when we do feel justified. But the Buddha's saying that anger is never justified and violence is never justified. It can only lead to more pain, more hatred in the world. So in that sense, these are talking about the opposite when we abstain. So shall I keep going with this little sequence and read through this sutta and we'll speak about it at the end. So the next one, again, a noble disciple having abandoned the taking of what is not given, abstains from the taking of what is not given. By abstaining from taking what is not given, the noble disciple gives an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. They themselves, in turn, enjoy immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. This is the second gift. And then it repeats that lovely paragraph. 
primal of long standing, etc. So, thirdly, a noble disciple having abandoned sexual misconduct abstains from sexual misconduct. By abstaining from sexual misconduct, the noble disciple gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. They themselves in turn enjoy immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. This is the next gift. So the numbers are all a bit mixed up here because Bhikkhu Bodhi's taken these out of the eight. So I think by now we're on the sixth. And then again, a noble disciple having abandoned false speech abstains from false speech. By abstaining from false speech, the noble disciple gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. He, they themselves in turn enjoy immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. This is the next gift. So it's actually the seventh in that sutta. And lastly, a noble disciple having abandoned liquor, wine, and intoxicants abstains from liquor, wine, and intoxicants, the basis for heedlessness. By abstaining from liquor, wine, and intoxicants, the noble disciple gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. They themselves in turn enjoy immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. This is the last gift, a great gift, primal, of long standing traditional, ancient, unadulterated, and never before adulterated, which is not being adulterated and will not be adulterated, not repudiated by wise ascetics and Brahmins. So any wise person is going to agree with these. They're not going to say anything different. They're not going to say you can be wise and have a little bit of alcohol and, you know, just push your partner around a little bit. You know, sometimes it's justified or, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's okay to cheat if you've been tempted, you know, you've just been weak. It's never going to lead to happiness. So it's not that they would judge you. They wouldn't judge you. We have the course, right, for confession, revealing, making amends, yeah. Deciding we'll do better next time, try to refrain from that harmful action. But certainly there can be no real place for this on the spiritual path. It can never be praised by anyone wise. And I think this is so lovely because it's talking about abstaining, but then it's also talking about the results of that and the gifts that come from that, which is not always um, made very explicit when we think about things like the precepts. So this is essentially the uh, five precepts that are being discussed here. The last one about intoxicants, it's, uh, I can really appreciate that because since uh, the lockdown started to ease and the pubs started to open again, there's so much shouting in the street right outside my house, you know, just because people have been there and they've been drinking a lot and then they walk down the street just hollering <laughs> in really loud voices. And uh, it does bring fear. It does bring a kind of sense of affliction because it sort of startles you, you know? And certainly I don't want to be like outside putting my dustbin out or whatever I might be doing when these folks are walking down the street completely unrestrained and really not knowing what they're doing at all. So you can really see the outcome of that. And the very first day actually after they opened and people were obviously drinking too much, there was a shoe outside the pub, <laughs> just a single shoe, not a really old shoe. So obviously some, somebody somewhere was separated from what they liked. <laughs> one of the causes of suffering being separated from what we like <laughs> so they lost their shoe it's really silly isn't it we really make our minds rather stupid through alcohol I think so pausing there for a moment I would really like to invite any comments or questions or um, anything from your own experience that might bring that alive uh, any thoughts or reflections anyone might have so please yeah great Gunther's put in that little verse so yes if you wish to speak then you can raise your hand if you prefer to uh, say anything ask a question um, impersonally you can put it in the chat box either to everyone 
or if you're really shy you can do it directly to myself I think by just pressing on that little arrow next to everyone so and if there's nothing we can, can carry on I'll give you a moment no all good I should have brought my special questions for you. <laughs> I'll get you talking at some point. Great. Ah, someone's putting some comments. I like it that these paragraphs describe the benefit of the precepts for the person who practices them and not only for other people. Mm. Yeah. That's really true. So it's tying it all up with the understanding of karma again, isn't it? It's quite a cleverly written little anthology because we started off uh, in this book with Right View and Karma, the law of cause and effect. And Sarah says, I remember together with Sila, they mentioned Sila protectors, Hiri and Otapa. Yeah, yeah, Hiri and Otapa, the guardians of the world, which are often translated as moral fear and moral dread. But I was thinking about that. I was thinking the Buddha's not really encouraging us to feel afraid or, you know, to have a sense of dread. So I prefer to think of them as like moral conscience, I suppose, for moral dread. I forget now which is which, Hiri and Otapa. And instead of moral shame, yeah, maybe it's moral conscience instead of moral shame. And instead of... Uh, moral dread I'd like to think of it as moral caution being cautious about what we do being restrained also so yeah these two qualities are very beautiful and you can see what happens can't you when uh, people don't have that sense of moral conscience I often wonder how some people can sleep at night and I guess some people do have to take sleeping pills right if that's you and you're a very good moral person, the sleeping pill for you is to be glad and happy, bring up that gladness and happiness from the wholesome things you have done. That might work really well. I'll just read one more comment from the box and then we'll come to John with his question. Yeah, Dinny says guardians is nice. I like that as well. And Jane says, living in a farming community, abstaining from taking life doesn't always go down well. Yet on a personal level, not standing on ants or spiders often has a powerful result for the good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because in that case, you would clearly be involved in an intentional act of killing. And by not stepping on them, you're intentionally refraining from that and it, it it has something very beautiful about it you know your mind is learning that it can have a measure of control self-control and it's just that extra care isn't it that you're giving to those ants and spiders like you're really valuing their life you're really trying to protect them yeah so so john can you unmute please Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vanda. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just um, reflecting on, 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 on the point that was just talked about just now as well about the the uh, non the, the not destruction the not, not destructing life or not not killing and um, and, I, and I'm I'm struggling at myself with it because I'm quite often working working alongside the meat and, and and preparing meat and I just you know. I do have a great deal of respect for, for, for uh, and, and, and I'm very close to nature as well. So I've got this dilemma all the time at the moment. So I'm sort of, uh, I'd like some advice maybe of how to sort of best go forward, I suppose. Yeah, your sound is quite um, echoey, so I didn't catch all of that. I understood that you said you have some discomfort working alongside me, and then that you yeah, respect yeah. you respect something. I didn't catch that. You respect, yeah, so I, I, and I respect life, and I have a great connection yeah. with 
all living things and I'm, and I am struggling but I'm struggling because I really do so when I should change my livelihood and do you know something different mm. at this stage uh, because mm -hmm. I've come to a realization but also at the same time it is my livelihood you see it's yeah difficult. yeah 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 it is difficult mm. and I think mm. you know we have to be gentle with ourselves to some degree um and not feel that this makes you a bad person and that you must change overnight and put yourself in a precarious situation financially you know because it's not that straightforward it takes time to um to know what to do and to weigh up kind of the pros and the cons in many ways right um but i think is the path starts happening naturally and at first something that felt okay initially once you do go a bit more deeper in dhamma you start to look at the subtleties of that. And like you say, there's some kind of incongruence there for you. There's a dissonance there between your values and what you're actually doing. And just sensing into how that feels, I think is really important at first. Um, and not rushing into a decision, right? Because there could be a lot of self-judgment in it. There could be sort of um, a kind of reactive sense of, oh, this is terrible or, no, 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 I have to carry on because, you know, this is what I was doing. And there's so processing those feelings that are coming up, I think, and allowing them to settle in their time. And I think the decision may become clearer over time. You could start looking into alternatives, but gently, without any pressure, just trying to connect to the beauty in that wish to purify. Even if you're not able to do it in the physical way, in the physical world, try and tap into the beauty behind it rather than sort of, you know, the guilt or the beating yourself up because that will increase those wholesome qualities whatever the physical outcome so I would I would say that and yeah I wouldn't want to make any judgment on that because people are in all kinds of different livelihoods for different reasons I had a long discussion with someone on Facebook who was saying I'm in this porn farming industry and it sort of happened unintentionally because at first he was just literally looking after pawns like as his pets and then it started to be very obvious that he could make a livelihood. Um, but his whole intention all along had been to look after these pawns and give them a really nice life. So even though it was now a livelihood, he still knew that he was really looking after them very well, much better than other people in the same industry. So <laughs> there were some positives to it. And, and for him also, I said, you know, it's a tricky one because if you put a question like that on a forum everybody has very judgmental black and white responses and it never is that black and white and I just really trust in the human being especially the human being on the Dhamma path that they are doing the best they can and that will become clearer and you will naturally purify your life over time so yeah I hope that helps to some degree yeah good Yeah, Maxwell has his real hand up. Yeah, sorry, I have difficulty on my iPad uh, to tick the correct boxes and everything, so. That's as okay, a, as, we, for, as, we forgive you. <laughs> I'm a bit old, I think, now and sometimes. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. I, I always liked, I don't know, uh, Albert Schweitzer's Sort of idea of reverence for life and i think i mean um, you know just put this thought out really if you rever revere life um whatever context you end up in if you're still revering life full stop life of a plant mm. life of a, a cockroach mm. Uh, not so far as life of a bacteria that will kill you, mind you. Exactly. That's, no, that's another thing. Yeah. But, but, you know, and sometimes I presume um, a, a friend is, is a, butch, a butcher um, and sometimes you are giving food maybe to underprivileged people, to poor people who you know, perhaps don't have enough money for a vegan 
type of food in a way um you know i'm just throwing these thoughts yeah yeah and and often um the greatest good for the greatest number of people also that's another concept you made me think of mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, but i think yeah. if, you know, if you have a the greatest reverence for life in everything you you do maybe that's going to help help you along in decisions you have to make yeah yeah that's beautifully put very right. beautifully put yeah yeah and also that you are purifying that motivation so even if mm -hmm. you know your physical actions don't aren't always as perfect as you may wish mm -hmm. them to be over time they will become more so because the motivation yep. will take over you know and yep. the physical conditions change right the physical conditions yep. we find ourselves in in life mm -hmm. uh, often we can't change them overnight you know this is why yep. samsara is a difficult place to be because yep. it's inevitable that we'll do some harm but if we just keep on purifying you know the mind at the root level eventually other things will start to fall into place to provide more conducive conditions for us. Yeah. And I think it's really important never to judge others on their dietary choices too, because I used to be vegetarian and then gradually pretty much vegan without the label, just because my diet was naturally mm. going that way. And um, dairy didn't suit me anyway. But then after getting very, very ill in Burma, the I couldn't keep anything down. I couldn't keep even rice gruel down. And right. I remember the first time that I thought I'm going to eat a piece of chicken. And it was the very first time I was out of Burma in the hospitals in Bangkok. And I was offered this plain piece of chicken and it actually sat in my stomach. And I started to gradually get a little bit more strength. And now I would find it very, very difficult to be on a vegan diet, but I reduce as much as I can. I eat the bare minimum of animal products and meat, um, knowing that this is the best I can do now. And if I can recover my health, then hopefully later on, I can, you know, gradually come off it again. And I know for myself that if I hadn't been so chronically sick and acutely sick at some point, um, and now it's chronically sick for how many years? 14 years, right? Um, I wouldn't have believed that there was ever a physical need and I was quite judgmental. So sometimes when we suffer, we understand it softens us. It makes us more compassionate and, you know, it, it, it allows us to imagine that there may be circumstances that we don't fully understand that have put the person in that particular situation. And again, always looking at what we can do, you know, to reduce, to reduce the harm, not to have unrealistic expectations of eradicating any possible harmful action in your life because it's just unrealistic and you're going to get discouraged so we do the best we can do and we all have qualities and strengths weaknesses you know some parts of our life will be incredibly pure other parts will be weaker yeah so denise oh yeah Hello, Disa, something else. We cannot not create suffering at all, but we should still do our best. And when we can avoid to generate suffering in animals, directly or indirectly, this is a good direction to go in. Exactly, exactly. And to be informed, because sometimes, you know, we're not informed as to how our dietary choices are affecting other beings. Um, to listen, you know, and to be really honest with ourselves, like, what can I do? Um, but not to imagine that we have to do our best overnight. You know, we might gradually do our best, like gradually, gradually reduce the harm because sometimes that's more sustainable. But absolutely, yes, you know, avoiding harm, avoiding suffering is the direction of the Dhamma. And Dini says, purifying one's motivation, that's beautiful and helpful. And again, I think I do believe that's at the heart of the path. The motivation of compassion even precedes right view in the gradual training. Or well, it's part of right view. Yeah. Understanding that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. 
with that sense of compassion, one then takes up the training. Actually, one hears the Dhamma, first of all. And then because you already understand that all beings want happiness, when you hear the Dhamma, there's suffering and there's a way out of suffering. It's like, yes, that's what this life is for. This, that's what this life is about. I was always asking that, you know, in my teens, it's like, how can I live a life whereby I can help alleviate suffering? And what is a compassionate response to the suffering in the world? I just, what is that compassionate response, you know? And here the Buddha's telling us, we can purify our mind. And it's wonderful when it's motivated by compassion rather than a sense of self-hatred or needing to be better because we're not good enough, you know? <laughs> it really gives it a richness and a lot of uh, beauty. Good. Um, yeah, I got the um, question, how do we purify? How do we purify our mind? What sticks out to me now when you ask, because it's such a massive question, but it's the first verse of the Dhammapada. <laughs> Basically, the Buddha says, um, abstain from unwholesome acts. In other words, deeds that cause suffering. Perform wholesome actions. And they're both of body, speech and mind, or body and speech in particular. And thirdly, keep on purifying the mind. Yeah. So it starts with virtue. It starts with virtue. And right view. I mean, the whole Eightfold Path keeps on circling around itself, right? So we understand that the suffering, we understand that, you know, just as I suffer, other beings suffer too. If somebody does something to me, like speaks to me harshly, I'm going to, you know, I, I won't enjoy that. I won't like that. That will hurt me. So if I speak that way to someone else, that will hurt them too. So we get this sense of empathy. But then I think I think what the Buddha's teaching is that he doesn't just say what we should do. He tells us how to do it and he gives us this path. So for me personally, it did start with a real sense of wanting to develop a lot of compassion and having quite a lot of natural empathy. But also I needed the practice. I needed meditation. I needed to sit on a cushion and watch what was going on in my mind. And that's where for me it really started. It was doing a 10 day retreat and having no other escape, no distraction, no cup of tea outside of the breakfast and lunchtime. You know, it was intensive, but I wanted that because I wanted to really look at what was going on in my mind. And from seeing that, it became very obvious that anytime I even think a, a slightly negative thought, I immediately suffer, you know? And whenever I um, think or, project into the future in a positive way I feel good I feel happy the you know good qualities start coming up and interestingly when those good qualities start coming up I would view my whole life differently you know I'd remember things from the past and I'd reframe them in much more positive ways and and uh, and also understanding that um, most of the time when we're reacting to things that we don't like in the environment or even in ourselves, we're actually reacting to the way things make us feel. And if we can come in contact with, through mindfulness, with those physical sensations in our body, those feelings that we have in our body and develop some awareness and then some equanimity, we basically put the brakes on and that can stop us, that can help us restrain ourselves from actually moving into unwholesome actions of body and speech. So for me, it was really important to see the mind at that level and to see how it was reacting and responding to whatever was going on inside. And I found after that retreat, actually, that my sealer just naturally really improved. It was pretty good, but it wasn't perfect. I would still have a little bit of, I shouldn't say this live, but a little bit of something sometimes in a full moon party, for example. <laughs> just very little, very little. But uh, after that, I was like, no, it, I just didn't need to do it. I didn't want to do it. It was uh, just the most natural thing. I didn't want to overstimulate my mind either, even with music. And there's nothing wrong with music, but I just wanted to be more fully present to whatever I was doing in that moment. And that was great because I was traveling over India, all through India, you know, on all the local buses as a very, very skint young traveler. So it was enough, it was mind blowing, you know, your whole world was opening up. So yeah, 
it, it was very wonderful. Janaki says, we purify our minds by being conscious of our own thoughts and actions. Yes, it can work that way too. The Buddha said, the mind precedes everything, deeds and actions, yeah. Mind precedes everything, mind matters most. If one speaks or acts with a pure mind, happiness follows like your shadow that never departs. If you speak or act with an impure mind, it's like <clears throat> the way that a cart follows the ox that's yoked to that cart. Yeah. Again, this is an internal law. Sanantano. A Buddhist is a person who is aware of his or her own mind. Yeah, I don't know what a Buddhist is, to be honest. I think it's up to you whether you call yourself a Buddhist or not. I couldn't get away with it much longer after I ordained. <laughs> I didn't used to refer to myself as an ist, anything ist. But the, thing, the fact is that I have great devotion to the Buddhist teachings and I try to walk the path. And I think that is what it's about. You know, you're trying to put the path into practice, right? We're not always aware of our own mind, but we're trying. Yeah, we're trying to cultivate and develop our own mind. Yeah, that's right. I, I do think that's what makes the difference, you know, because many people are trying their best. And, and I think most human beings are very good beings and generally kind beings. I think that's why we're human, humanity, humane. This is all relating to a human person, a human being is a good birth. But someone on the path is someone who's becoming conscious and who's actively taking responsibility for our behavior in the world. And I think that makes a big difference. You know, and we're very fortunate. We should never judge ourselves as better than others. We're just fortunate because we've encountered the Buddhist teachings. Other people might encounter them later and become, you know, take even faster steps on the path. They may super, what do you call it? Not supersede, but uh, uh, surpass or uh, overtake us on the path. So there isn't really a very obvious distinction in my mind between a Buddhist and a non-Buddhist. And I think a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim person or an atheist like my dad can be very beautiful beings too. Yeah. But for me, the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha's path is just incredibly practical. It's like a really user friendly manual, you know, with so much detail. It's not just like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's so much detail around that you know, and not just your own development, but like spiritual friendship, you know, the importance of being around the right people, having the right places to live, um, speaking suitable things at the right time, speaking about the Dhamma, taking refuge in the qualities of a Buddha, Dhamma Sangha. It's, it's vast and it applies to every aspect of our life. So this is why I love the Buddha's teaching so much, because it's something I can really Get, to, get a handle on and apply directly in my everyday life. It's one of the reasons I wanted to do the sutta class because we have to make these suttas work for us. You know, we have to actually apply them and start living them. Otherwise they're just words in a book that you beat someone else over the head with, right? In my book, it says this, your book's wrong. Your book talks about God or talks about this. Who cares if somebody's living the Dhamma, right? But I do have obviously enough confidence in the Buddha to suspect that even the realm of the gods is not the end. We can we can even go beyond that. So yeah. Yes, I'm getting inspired now. I didn't think I would say very much. So perhaps I should carry on with the book. So you also have <laughs> some more opportunity to get engaged. And uh, I forgot to put my light on, but I'll carry on and see if I can just about see the book. Okay. So I'll give you, give myself a little pause. Okay. So this is just another recap, really. And we've already gone into more detail. This is from the Anger to a 10. And this excerpt is called The Bad and the Good. Community, I will teach you what is good and what is bad. You could also say wholesome and unwholesome. You could also say beneficial and unbeneficial. But it's always good or bad, etc. in the context of does it lead to suffering or does it lead out of suffering? 
And what is the bad? The destruction of life, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, false speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, covetousness, ill will and wrong view. This is called the bad. And what is the good? Abstention from the destruction of life, abstention from taking what is not given, abstention from sexual misconduct, abstention from false speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, etc. That's all the speech. Abstention, oh, sorry, non covetousness, benevolence, and right view. So that's interesting because, in addition, to the first four precepts and he goes into more detail about speech there is also non-covetousness benevolence and right view so non-covetousness is like not wishing that you had something someone else has or feeling that you want more and more of something right you're satisfied you're content with what you have and then benevolence here is the opposite of ill will. Basically, it's a translation for avyapada, which could also be rendered as metta. But I like the word benevolence actually for avyapada. It's quite a beautiful word. And it brings slightly different nuance. And right view. So you see how the right view is tied in again to the precepts, to the virtue, to our virtuous behavior. We have to understand that there's suffering and there's a way out, that there's also the uh, effects our actions have effects you know they're not neutral we can't just do what we want and expect that to not ensue in in suffering or happiness it actually does and also remember that part of right view is um, at least a preliminary openness to the idea of karma ripening not only in this life but also in future lives mm -hmm. so that may be the case I don't think we should close our minds to that, even if we've not experienced it, because the whole point of the Buddha's path is to um, examine and explore. So I think I'll carry on because uh, it'd be nice to read a little bit more. But this is quite a long one, so we'll see how we go. How's people's energy? Would you like me to do more? Yeah? Anyone feeling it's... Yeah? Okay, like. So this one is called Impurity and Purity. And this is from the Anguttara 10, 176. So it's quite a long one. Impurity by body, Chunda, and Chunda was a monk, is threefold. Write it down. <laughs> Impurity by speech is fourfold. And impurity by mind is threefold, which makes ten. And how is impurity by body threefold? Number one, here someone destroys life. They are murderous, bloody handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Number two, they take what is not given. They steal the wealth of property of others in the village or the forest. Number three, they engage in sexual misconduct. They have sexual relationships, sexual relations. I'm going to leave this as women here, not because of any sort of bias, but because this was more cultural in this case. So it's hard to kind of turn it around. So this is about a man in this case has sexual relations with a woman who, women who are protected by their mother, father, father and mother, brother, sister or relatives who are protected by their Dhamma, who have a husband whose violation entails a penalty or even with one already engaged. It is in this way that impurity by body is threefold. And just to say on that one, obviously, any kind of um, sexual misconduct with anyone, male or female, non-binary, transgender, it's really beyond gender, any kind of um, breach of trust, yeah, 
violation it's talking about here and uh, it's not even talking only about abuse but actually engaging with people who are um, basically not available yeah so in this case it's uh, in ancient India the women would have been protected in in certain ways protected by their dhamma I imagine must mean by their particular um, religious views or um, the traditions in their family or their household, their customs, in a sense. Um, yeah, and they're even with one already engaged, obviously. So you're, you're basically breaching trust, um, you're in violation, violation. And there may be um, um, deceit involved. So then we go on to speech and how Chanda is impurity by speech fourfold. Here, someone speaks falsehood and then we get more detail. If they are summoned to a council, to an assembly, to their relatives presence, to their guild or to the court and questioned as a witness thus, so good person, tell what you know. Then not knowing they say, I know or knowing they say, I do not know. Not seeing they say, I see, or seeing they say, I do not see. Thus they consciously speak falsehood for their own ends or for another's ends or for some trifling worldly end. Just reminds me of courts really, where we tried to twist the evidence and try and say, you know, something didn't happen the way that it was videoed. So it's very obviously happened that way, uh, basically just to get out of whatever punishment you may incur. There'll be many, many other examples. And then the next one, one speaks divisively. Having heard something here, they repeat it elsewhere in order to divide those people from these. Or having heard something elsewhere, they repeat it to these people in order to divide them from those. Thus, one is one who defines those who are united, a creator of divisions, one who enjoys factions, rejoices in factions, delights in factions, a speaker of words that create factions. And this is subtle because I think to some extent it's something we all might slip into from time to time. Right? because we want our friends to agree with our perception of another person, yeah? And then that might actually affect the way they relate to that other person. And yet other times I, I feel with this that we can speak with the right people about things that we're not sure about, if our motivation is to try and get a clearer understanding that would actually lead to harmony, that would actually promote harmony in the longer run but I think it's something to be really careful with. And it creates so much work for people who then have to restore harmony. Then number three, one speaks harshly. One utters such words as are rough, hard, hurtful to others, offensive to others, bordering on anger, unconducive to stillness. So here I'm translating samadhi as stillness. And it makes sense here because shouting and anger and anything that's really coarse is obviously the opposite of something that's still. It's boiling water as opposed to still water of a lake. And then the fourth type of wrong speech, one indulges in idle chatter. One speaks at an improper time, speaks falsely, speaks what is unbeneficial, speaks contrary to the Dhamma and the discipline. At an improper time, one speaks such words as are worthless, unreasonable, rambling and unbeneficial. It is in this way that impurity by speech is fourfold. Somebody asked about that um, idle chatter and gossip in a previous sort of class, and I think this makes it a little clearer as to what the definition really is. Because it's not even saying we can never say words that are worthless, it's saying at an improper time. And for example, words that are rambling, because I think all of us, you know, we're not always as concise as we could be. We might ramble a bit or we might kind of 
just say things that are a bit like time pass, right? But here it's saying at an improper time. So I think if there's two friends who are just having a bit of a joke and laugh, it's probably quite a good time. You know, you're not actually imposing on each other's time. It's, it's almost like you've agreed to it together. But you'll probably notice after some time it will be come tiring and it may start the mind kind of slipping and sliding into not quite such a noble state. So I'd like to pause there and maybe actually even stop there for today because I know that right speech is a very deep and extensive subject and certainly one that I think is probably the most difficult. It's fairly easy for someone who's practicing or has a regular practice, um, even hopefully most people who don't, not to actually be a violent person, not to steal, etc or to uh, have sexual relationships with the wrong people. That's harder for some people. I mean, it's common, isn't it? That people cheat on each other. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, even sexual abuse is far, far, far too common. So that is uh, difficult because lost passion, you know, it's not always lust and passion. I think in the case of abuse, it can be hate, control, power. That is a little bit, it's a, it's a very, very strong force in people. But uh, as far as speech is concerned, it's something that we can be working on always. Also because speech has such a great capacity to serve. Okay, so somebody's asking if abuse and rape is related to the third precept. So the third precept is like sexual misconduct, right? Yeah, so these are going through those, um, those precepts, basically. It's going through the first, second, third, and fourth. It's not talking about alcohol here. But it's interesting, because when you wrote that, I was actually thinking that it's pertaining to the first as well, because it's violence. It's violence. So I would say it's a very, very coarse violation of the first and the third. Yeah. So I wanted to pause on speech and basically if there are any comments or questions on anything we've discussed today, um, it would be nice to hear from you. We've only got a few minutes left, but it would be nice. Yes, James, I'm asking you to unmute. Okay, Hello. we'll just have James and Connie and then we'll finish for tonight. Uh, Hi, James. Hi, uh, yeah, the, the restriction on speech is something I found particularly intriguing when I first started getting into this, because it's, as you say, the killing, sexual misconduct, stealing is kind of self-evident. Right. This is far more nuanced. And like, obviously, having been locked away for so long in lockdown, there's not many opportunities to sort of practice it. But now I'm back at work in a shop. There's so many more opportunities to, you know, do it in, in sort of subtle ways. And you realise you've transgressed. And it's, it's, you know, when you're having gossip between people and, and things like that, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very difficult one, isn't it? It's, it is, uh, yeah. We're habituated. I guess there's that desire to connect as well. So sometimes we get pulled in without really wanting to but just through connect wanting to connect yeah i mean i mean that's one thing i've found is that sometimes you kind of like bond with a group by kind of hating on someone else yeah uh, i don't mean in a really nasty kind of like let's lynch mm -hmm. them sort of way, but just, <laughs> just just complaining about people you know it's the british way isn't it? mm. it's about yeah. and the things yeah. they've said and yeah yeah and so so yeah so it, it, it's hard to get away from and <laughs> It is. And I think it's um, important to see what effect it has on your mind, because I, I could feel it when you were sort of relating that, that you don't really like the effect it has on your mind. Like you can see that it's not really elevating. It's not really ennobling. Yeah. You know, yeah. it might be culturally accepted, but it's not something that's uplifting. Um, but I am finding I'm building a more of an instinct for when, when it's when I've gone wrong. Yeah. Um, but it tends to be moments afterwards rather than moments before at the minute. But uh, perhaps I'll get better in with time. 
yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly and yeah. sometimes i think you know it can be hard to interject but sometimes it is possible to say something even in that context like oh yeah but they're also not so bad in this way or and actually sometimes people are quite happy when one person breaks it and I'm then trying. they say oh yeah that's right actually because the thing is it yeah. feels better to be generous and charitable well that's the thing unfortunately in my working environment I have someone who does complain a lot and he, you yeah. know, he's an arse guy, there's nothing wrong with him, but he is a little bit, you know, yeah. whingy about him. So, so I'm, I'm actively encouraging him to be more empathetic, you know, right. and, yeah. an alternative viewpoint and say, well, do you really know that for sure? But, you know, yeah. but I'm, yeah. I'm kind of half thinking, is, is that right though? I mean, should I be sort of like, is that divisive though, to disagree and to try and persuade him otherwise, you know what I mean? It's sort of, yeah. I mean, the thing that just popped into my mind is that sometimes when people are complaining, it, rather than engaging with what they're saying, even trying to correct it, perhaps you could just notice that he might not be that happy. And perhaps instead you could say something to him like, yeah, that's really true. It must be difficult. And, you know, you're doing really well. Like, I think you're a really great person. And I mean, it has to be a bit genuine, right? <laughs> you can't just. But I think to try and bring some positive energy to that person might be good. Like you know mm. see how you can relate to them in a way that makes them feel a bit better um, well he's not he's not really a negative person it's more of a oh it's hard to explain but yeah, but, uh, yeah it's not coming out of a lack of self-worth i don't think it's, okay. it's more it's, it's just, he's, a daily, he's, a, he's a daily mail reader and believes oh, everything dear. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I do, yes. So that, yes. that just really aggravates me anyway. But, uh, yeah, that's yeah, hard. Trying, trying to persuade them otherwise. And I do think I'm having a positive effect on this. I'm sure you are. Sometimes it's just being kind and non-reactive and keeping on the side of the wholesome that has a, it rubs off on people. Yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go to Connie. We don't have long, so just uh, if we can... Can you please? Yeah, thank you. Hi. It was really just um, again on the speech, uh, on the harsh speech. Mm. I think I think my upbringing um, it possibly made me come over quite harsh with people. You know, I think it was very much say what you think, um, which is good. You know, you're quite honest, but I think I, I think. In the past, I have been very harsh sounding, and I have probably hurt a lot of people's feelings in the mm. the way that I've put things over to them. Um, and I think it's just becoming aware. I think recently I've really noticed mm. if I have spoken harshly again, it's I kind of notice it afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think just having to spend that a little bit longer before I, I react or I, I answer someone, just you know, just. Yeah. put yourself in their position how would they feel mm -hmm. how would I feel spoken to in the way that I possibly speak to others yeah so yeah. yeah yeah great but, I mean okay. that's yeah 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 I mean that's directly applying the first teaching isn't it that we just reflected back on in the beginning about it reflecting before during and after and the more we can get into that habit the more it will start to become natural yeah 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 Great. There's lots of lovely uh, comments here too that just give a little bit more. Someone was saying, I'll just summarize it really shortly. Uh, someone was saying that they think a little bit of um, small talk is okay. And someone else suggested humor to dismantle nasty discourses. That's really great because humor doesn't feel moralizing. Uh, yeah, and someone else so that right speech is challenging with all the intricacies of human interaction, which is, yeah, a really ongoing practice, isn't it? So wonderful. Gosh, I also gain a lot from these discussions. So, um, yeah, if I can just invite uh, Kelly to say a couple of words at the end, and then I'm going to give you some more news of a couple of things. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much, Venerable Chanda, for this evening's Sutta discussion. Um, so I'd like to say a few words about dana, the practice of generosity. So today's session is offered on a donation basis and any contribution you are able to make would be very gratefully received. Um, it will support Venerable Chanda's material needs and help her to continue spreading the dhamma. 
uh, as well as supporting the setting up and the development of the first Bikuni monastery in the UK. So more information about the project and how to donate can be found on the website and the link for that is in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, yeah, so thank you everybody. I really enjoy these too. And I just wanted to quickly mention a few upcoming events, even though it will be in the newsletter. But um, for those who haven't already registered, there's still a few places at Ajahn Brahm and myself. We're doing an interview on the 1st of May, 12.30 till two. So because the newsletter is gonna be quite like maybe the day before if I'm lucky. <laughs> um, if you want to join that, there is a link. Do my co-host remember it? Retreats at newbuddhaway.org. You have to write to them and ask for the joining link for that. And uh, I'm not sure it will be recorded. So it might be quite interesting. It's called Bikuni Ordination and Why It Matters. So we really invite any provocative, is that the right word? or probing questions, <laughs> including controversial questions. But I don't think there's anything controversial because they never ask bhikkhus why it matters, right? They never ask, so why should we have bhikkhu ordination? That's a kind of given. So that will happen. And Ajahn Brahmali's retreat still has spaces for anyone who would like to join full time from the 16th to the 23rd of May. That's on our events page, anacampaproject.org slash events. And yeah, so during that retreat, there'll be a few sessions that we don't do. And I'm actually not sure that we're going to do this session next week. I might be tired, but I'll do it if I can. But maybe, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. So if you're on the newsletter, you'll get notified there. Um, and then, yeah, on the 30th of May, or the 31st, the last Sunday in May, there'll be a Sunday evening Zoom session instead of the Sunday evening that we will have missed during Ajahn Brahmali's retreat. Okay? But that'll all be in the newsletter anyway. So you're the first to know. <laughs> and uh, next coming up is tomorrow, actually, tomorrow morning Meta meditation from 9 till 10 UK time so do join us if you're able we'll be practicing loving kindness together for that session so really nice to see you and I hope you enjoyed this evening take care and uh, yeah we'll unmute you so that you can wave goodbye if you wish and say goodbye if you wish bye